my friends on the days and off the days. Forgive me for not mentioning names. And friends all. It's a lucky thing for me that I am a lawyer of 47 years of practice. During which time I have learned that you may prepare your case as well as you can and as best as you can. But if you go into the court and the judge is in full flow brilliantly, then you will have to rethink how you argue your case. Thank you, Dr. Jerk. Thank you, Dr. Jerk. Have you ever the bed? <laughs> That's a good point. You try. Because, yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing about Justice Venkatesh. He is my nearest equivalent in India of Lord Denny. And one. <laughs> And I'll tell you why. Lord Delhi was famous for anything. He was an iconoclast. He broke several molds. When he wanted to do something new, the, the opposition from his judges, or from the lawyers would say, but it's never been done before. And Delhi's answer was, well, that problem will not be there after my judgment. <laughs> The Constitution is supreme. The court decides what the Constitution says and means. The court is the interpreter of the Constitution. The court is the defender of the Constitution. And the court is the guardian of the Constitution. Acts of the executive can be struck down as contrary to the Constitution. But more, laws made by Congress, parliaments, can be struck down as contrary to the Constitution. Even a constitutional amendment made by parliament can be struck down as opposed to the basic structure of the Constitution. So the court becomes the equal of the legislature and the executive. And in fact, it has the last word. But without the power of judicial review, where is there anything of the above? And without judicial review, where is the court? And where is the constitution? And without John Marshall, where is judicial review? That is why Oliver Wendell Holmes said about this man. He said, if American law were to be represented by a single figure, skeptic and worshipper alike would agree that this figure could be one alone. And that one, John Marshall. That's the Venkatesh has told me about his background, how he served in the army, he was a diplomat, he was in Congress, he was Secretary of State, worked with the Home Minister under John Adams, and then Adams is almost as his last act when he couldn't get anybody else to fill the vacancy of the office of the Chief Justice, turned to Marshall and said, we will take it. On 4th February 1801, he became the fourth Chief Justice in the United States. He was 45. He had never been a judge. He was a lawyer. He was a diplomat, he 
He did many things in politics, but he'd never been a judge. And that is something perhaps this, this country has to consider that it is so keen each time that every judge who went to the Supreme Court must have spent you know, X number of years in the High Court. It's good to have some other people in it, academics, for example. When he joined, because can this come down a bit? Alright, so okay. it's up. When he joined, the Supreme Court had little power and prominence. It didn't have its own building. Very few cases. Judges went on circuits over hundreds of miles of bad roads. In 12 years, there were three chief justices and no one was interested. When Marshall left 34 years later, he laid down principles of policy and law which still apply. He rebuked two presidents and ordered one to testify in the courtroom. He struck down acts of Congress and state legislatures. He established the court as the defender and definer of the Constitution. The judiciary has no purse, it has no sword. But he created judicial review as an equal power to the purse and the sword. And he pursued a strong union. It is said about him that he transformed the constitution from a compact among the states into a charter of national life. And that is something in India which we need to do. We need to create our constitution as a charter of national life. It said that Marshall's mind was like an Atlantic Ocean compared to the ponds of many others. But his personality is what strikes you. A man of never failing courtesy, good humor, high spirits, a way with people. I must also tell you that he was very fond of Madeira wine. And the wine merchants in Washington labeled their premium stuff as they called it the Supreme Court. <laughs> it used to be practiced among the judges and on a rainy evening they would have a glass of wine. Marshall came along and said, we have a vast jurisdiction. It must be raining somewhere. Come on, let's have wine. <laughs> he was a leader of men. He was a guider. He was a master conciliator. And those who came opposing fell under his magnetic, powerful, positive personality. Marshall started the practice of the court speaking through one voice. 1,100 opinions. <clears throat> and as Justice Venkatesh said, half were offered by Marshall. He was in dissent only eight times. And remember, the court sat as one. There's no question of using the roster to pick your police. The court sat as one, bench of six or nine. Justice Venkatesh has touched upon Marbury and Madison very fully. I will just add a couple of lines. That the office itself for which this Marbury wanted was an office of justice of the peace. It wasn't very, you know, very prominent. They could only decide cases about $20 worth, that's all. But interestingly, they got to keep, they didn't get a salary, but they kept a percentage of the fine, which would interest a lot of, you know, enforcement directed and income tax. <coughs> So you've heard about how Marbury came to court and Marshall said, yes, you have a good case, you're entitled to this, and uh, the Secretary of State must give you this commission, but the Constitution does not give us original power. The Judiciary Act, which gives us this power, is contrary to the Constitution. The Constitution is supreme. Marbury loses, court wins, because it gains a huge power. 
the power to strike down an act of Congress. So as Justice Vinkitate said, it's a master stroke. He won the jackpot. And he put the Supreme Court front and center in the dramatic scheme of national politics. Now let's come to India. I'm going to quote Justice Mukherjee in A.T. Gopalan. He said, the Constitution of India is a written constitution. And though it has adopted many of the principles of the English parliamentary system, it has not accepted the English doctrine of the absolute supremacy of parliament in matters of legislation. In this respect, it has followed the American constitution and other systems modeled on it. That was a preventive retention case. And then we had cases of land acquisition and compensation. There was a striking judgment in the 50s in currency series, upholding the right of privacy and striking down a UP surveillance law. But it was the 60s and 70s where we saw a lot of action. And that revolved around Parliament's power to amend the Constitution. And in Goloknath's case, Justice Subarao and Bench held that while amending, you cannot touch the fundamental rights. That was too much for Mrs. Gandhi to take. The law was amended. The question had to be gone into again. And in Keshav and Bhakti, the court retreated somewhat. They said, well, we go back from this point that you can't touch the fundamental rights. You may, but you cannot touch the basic structure of the Constitution. And we will define what the basic structure is, which is the important elements of the Constitution and national life. The <coughs> fundamental freedoms of expression, association, right to free and fair elections, except several others, and the right the court held to add to it. They added secularism later. So again, you know, the power of judicial review to test what Parliament is doing and to check its overreach. There's a nice story you know, about checking this relationship between the court and the government. When Justice Titus Vekachanaya became Chief Justice, there was a reception to him by the Prime Minister Mr. Narsibara. He made a very nice speech to reception, and in the course of that he said, we look forward to cordiality between us and you now. Justice Venkachalaya, in his very sweet fashion, in reply, he said, the constitution envisages that we are a check and a balance. Constitutionally, we are meant to be at odds with each other, not concrete. He said very sweetly, in a very cordial fashion, so as to give no offence. That is the point. And then, of course, we had that shameful case, ABM Double Court, where the Supreme Court 4 to 1 held that while in an emergency and the application suspension of Article 21, a citizen has no right to liberty. The only man who stood out was Justice Kandahar. Again, Minerva Mills, an amendment seeking to curtail judicial review was struck down. And recently, Justice Nariman offered a very interesting further test of legislation, not just legislative competence, not just are you in breach of the Constitution, but he tagged on manifest arbitrariness, which is a very interesting concept. And I must pause here. And tell you that in the last 20 years, barring a few, my impression is that judicial review has been pretty much on the absent list. The National Judicial Appointments case was a significant one, where the court struck down an act of parliament. 
But many people saw that as the court protecting its own turf, its own right to appoint judges, not the public's interest. Electoral bonds too is a victory for the right to information. But it is a victory which came five years too late. If cases are decided later than sooner, sooner or later is a phrase, but cases are decided later than sooner, then what is left in the case if the people who got the money and got the money have not been asked to give it back? What's left in the case is that shutting that stable door after the horse is left. So whether it's the same sex case or the demonetization or Article 370 or the thing, judicial review I think has been limited to use a, must use a nice word. We have two important cases coming up. One is the CAA, the Citizen, Citizenship Amendment Act. And the other is the challenge for the places of worship. And both these are hugely important for this country. There's also going to be a question of interest to see who sits to decide these cases. Because in India, the position is such that it is the master of the roster, the Supreme Court, Chief Justice, who decides which bench out of 30 judges will sit to decide. And that is a great, great power. Because no two judges are similar. Each one has their views. So, who's going to decide? The only thing one would say is larger benches are preferable and some measure of seniority. But let me come to the other big issue. And this is what I would call the Frankenstein on the legal landscape. And that is the Prevention of money laundering. The powers to summon, to question, to arrest, and to deny bail are unparalleled. The agency can call anybody it likes without punishing good reasons. It can arrest, once arrested. The presumption of innocence is lost. Every person who is arrested is under the presumption of innocence. Till you are convicted, you are presumed to be innocent. This is the law from the Magna Carta downwards and upwards. Presumed innocent till proved guilty by a competent court. This horrible legislation inverts that. And I'll tell you why it inverted it. So that the court must come to a conclusion that prima facie this man is innocent. After a long hearing, it will take months before releasing him. Not sufficient to say, well, he's not a flight risk, he's not going to tamper with the evidence, he can be released in the appropriate case. You see, this money laundering started with drugs and narcotics and organized crime. Psychotrophic substances and narcotic drugs. And it was to deal with money laundering derived from these practices that a special kind of enactment was thought of worldwide. The way that was expanded from drugs and narcotics to wildlife offenses to gun trading. And one more similar offense where very serious and harmful to society involves complex secretive operations worldwide and transfer of monies. And therefore, the need for extra precautions to tackle people who indulge in these heinous offenses. But what has happened is under PMLA now. A whole host of offences, ordinary offences, even including under the Environmental Protection Act, something even under the Publishing uh, Act, a whole host of offences have been classified as scheduled offences under this Act. 
virtually any major dealing or operation can be brought in here because you have the IPC, you have section 150. And this is not any, there is no blame here attached to the one political party. This started during the populist regime and been further during the BJP, so there is no one particular party to blame. Sorry, this tag goes, or blame goes along fully along the political spectrum. There is something called a Brandeis group. It was created by this wonderful lawyer, Louis Brandeis. He eventually became a judge of the American Supreme Court. But what he did in his cases, he would not argue it just from the point of law. He would back up his case with a mass of sociological data and evidence. So that if he was arguing a case, let us say, to limit the amount of hours that workers should work, he wouldn't just go from the statute. He would bring in medical investigations, research, scholarly writing, expert opinion to back up his point. Now, if somebody did a Brandeis brief today on the PMA, you will find that the record of convictions under PMLA and UAPA is pitifully weak. It's very one or two percent of cases they managed to get a conviction. But that means the accused has spent long years in jail. And ultimately he's let out, but he spent five years, ten years in jail. Time out, how long did he spent? That electoral bonds are given after the ED knocks. That wholesale changes take place in the assembly compositions after an election. Lose an election, but you know, if the EV is helpful, you may gain. And people have been in states which have changed. 25 cases against politicians in switch sides, 21 are no longer seeing the heat of the EV. Ministers and chief ministers are jailed. This is your Brandeis brief in an EV case. It is not a question to be told. Of just looking at section 45, reading two lines and saying, oh, we can't give bail because we have to find why not they see innocence. And to look at the situation, if eyes are closed myopically, to look at just the instant case, that is not an exercise of judicial review proper. <clears throat> That's it. Blame has to go in multiple directions to different political parties, but in my view also to the Supreme Court. To one judgment in a case called Vijay Madan Lal, where every onerous aspect of the PMLA case was considered by the Supreme Court, contrary to an earlier judgment of Justice Royton Arikan, Justice Kandinkar said, upheld every contrary and <clears throat> I would say dangerous practice of the PMLA. When I read that judgment, <sighs> I think I was watching football then. There was a match in the World Cup. Germany defeated Brazil 7 nil. And I said, well, this is pretty much like this judgment. The state seven citizen nil. But beyond that also is something what I felt was a, a certain voice and what they call the inarticulate major premise. That the state is supreme, the citizen must vote. Is what I felt when I read those that judgment. So it is an argue judgment which deserves to be recalled. I hope it will be. It's under review, but it's as dangerous a judgment as the one passed during the emergency. But there is something more against judicial review. When a chief minister is arrested during an election, the right to the Supreme Court to say we won't deal with it, go to a trial court. 
And just the previous day, the Chief Justice of India said, trial court judges are apprehensive about deciding cases under the MLA. And you still say go to the trial court? And again, this presumption of constitutional clarity. It is sometimes, I think, overdone. The court found that the election, appointment of the election commissioners of India was faulty. And it said the Chief Justice of India should be one of the three. There should be the PM, the Chief Justice, and the leader of the opposition. And this will hold the field till the proper law is made. And a new law is made. And the Chief Justice of India has shown the exit door. And an ordinary minister becomes in his place. And the Supreme Court doesn't stay it. I mean, there is no presumption, certainly, when you are going against the verdict of court. So these are some difficult voices to hear. But now let me take you to some other kind of voices. My favorite in India, Vivian Bose. In Hadra was the state of Rajasthan, he was considering some case where people were enforcing some opium laws, I think, had very great powers in the tribunal. And now listen to these words and mark them in the context of some of these present cases. That's why I got them. Both said, it is inconceivable that a representative of His Britannic Majesty would have contemplated the creation of a body which wields powers so abhorrent to the fundamental principles of natural justice which all freedom loving people share. I think Vivian Bose had decided PMA Day. In six pages, he would have sent it to the dustbin. In case, he must. Where there were some benefits given to a civil servant because something had, some tangle had gone wrong with the appointment, government tried to rectify it. But the court was very, you know, kind of nitpicking and went into great detail on a particular point. The boss is in dissent. Look at his wording. He says, We, the courts, are out Shylocking Shylock in demanding a pound of flesh. He's talking about his fellow judges. He said, you are outlock, out Shylock in Shylock. In demanding a pound of flesh. And why? Because of this writ is in the pond. Meaning, the strict letter of the law. He says, I will have none of it. All I can see is a man who's been wronged. And I can see a plain way out. I would take it. And I will tell you what both have done get you. You have simply said, you are quoting section 45, that I can release him only if I find that he's prima facie not guilty. Very good. I'll give you a case tomorrow. Finished? But here is a masterpiece. Goes again. Brush aside for the moment the petty fogging of the law and forget for the nonce all the learned disputations about this and that, and or all, may and must. Look past the mere verbiage of the words and penetrate deep into the heart and spirit of the constitution. What sort of state are we intended to be? Have we not here been given a way of life? The right to individual freedom, the utmost the state can confer in that respect consistent with its own safety. Is not the sanctity of the individual recognized and emphasized again and again? Is not our constitution in violent contrast to those of states, where the state is everything and the individual but a slave or a serf to serve the will of those who for the time being wield almost absolute power. I have no doubts in this call. I hold it therefore to be our duty 
when there is ambiguity or doubt about the construction of any clause in the chapter of fundamental rights, to resolve it in favor of the freedom which have been so solemnly stressed. This answers the question is it state or people? You law students, I beg you, go and read Vivian Bose's judgment in Anwar Ali Sarkar's case. State of West Bengal versus Anwar Ali Sarkar. Please read his judgment. Your eyes will open to the magnificence of the law, the majesty of the court. And that is where he quotes an American case and he says, you may have power, but if you have the power to apply the law with an evil eye and an unequal hand, I will not stand for it. An evil eye and an unequal hand. I can go on about both, but I will take the rest of it. Marshall and Bose are my personal favorites. Let me come to another great judge, Yasir Shah Khanna. The man who had the spine to stand firm during the magic. And he says, the principle that no one shall be deprived of his life or liberty without the authority of law is rooted in the consideration that life and liberty are priceless possessions which cannot be made the plaything of individual whim and caprice. You know, I think that after the emergency, we should have amended the constitution and made H.R. Khanna Chief Justice for life. Instead of making who we did. And just imagine, my friends, John Marshall served for 34 years. If this country had had Vivian Bose and H.R. Khanna, as its chief justices for a long, long period of time, they would have been in such a position. In the end, as Dr. Ambedkar said, it all comes down to the individual. Three things in that individual. The quality of mind. How the heart beats and for whom. Third, most important, the quality of the spine. The constitutional spine. Because that is where constitutional morality resides. In the steely spine, not the silvery tongue. Judicial review is important for citizens because it is their only method of challenging the wrongdoings of the state. Judicial review is important for the court because it is only through exercise of judicial review, which is like a muscle, it must be exercised, not left to atrophy. It is through exercise of judicial review that the court establishes itself as a defender of the constitution and a check, a balance, institution, co-equal with all others. And judicial review is essential for a democracy. The kind of democracy that our constitution enlists liberty, equality, fraternity, justice, opportunity. And for politicians too, judicial review is essential. Because political fortune is but a wheel. Nobody is up there permanently. And it is when the wheel is down that politicians realize the value of judicial review. Important to them as well. But it is up to every generation of judges to keep alive that constitutional claim. Other institutions may fail, and some are failing. But the judicial fault must be held at all costs, irrespective of which party is in power. For so power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and majoritarian governments can all too easily override constitutional freedom. 
In a recent article, I paid an omnibus to Justice Oka, Justice Bhagavatna of the Supreme Court. I also would like to mention Justice Ujwal Bhaiya for some very forthright remarks on the paper. And I paid tribute to Justice Vekitesh. Bombay judges who release Sai Baba. I said, these are These are swallows in the summer which hopefully bring about ever the change of weather. But it is not only judges, it is all of us who have a duty. It is professionals, especially lawyers, it is students, especially law students. It is the media, it is the corporate, it's the academics, it's the man on the street. My senior used to say, not the Tottenham bus, but the Tropican bus. It is your work, it is your conversation, it is sharing a post, it is making views known, it is voting and getting others to vote. It is therefore all of us who matter, who must matter, and who must take care. May God bless us and watch over us and may He abide with us. Jai Hind.